is I have a bunch of really good, insightful questions that they gave me, which is good. But really what we want to do is have this be an interactive conversation. So we will have some sort of direction. Um, it isn't necessarily the case that everyone has to answer each question. You can direct them at specific people. John, you can't ask me questions unless you have to. Um, but really, the more you guys interact with us, the more fun and entertaining this will be. And it is our goal to entertain and enlighten you. Correct? And have fun. And have fun, yes. And so what I want to do is I want to introduce each of these panelists. And this is a really rocking panel. So you guys really made the right choice. And just for one moment, we'll almost sound Scottish, but that's not the panel you're at now. Okay, so now we're back to this. So I'm going to start with Brett. And Brett is co-founder of Hip Chameleon Marketing and Social Media and was named the number three chief marketing officer. There's somewhere to go to, so that's good. Um, on Twitter by Social Media Marketing Magazine. He is an integrative marketing advisor with a master's degree in psychology who writes about social media, psychology, marketing, and life at blindinfluence.com and the Huffington Post. Thank you, Brett. And then next to him is Joshua Dorkin, who is the founder and CEO of biggerpockets.com. And it is not a pool or billiard site, right? Correct. It is, in fact, a premier, the nation's premier real estate investing community. He serves as the editor of the celebrated Bigger Pockets blog with dozens of expert contributors from all aspects of real estate and has syndicated its columns to such destinations as AOL Real Estate. Remind me, AOL stands for? Okay. <laughs> Business Insider and Realtor.com. And in case you're not getting the tone here, we're going to have fun with this. So if you're thinking you would need something really serious, you so came into the wrong room. Next to Josh is the fabulous Janine Crooks. She is account manager with Buy.at Affiliate Network and has been helping websites and blog owners monetize their sites through affiliate marketing since 1999. She is the co-organizer of the Front Range Bloggers Meetup and currently blogs about travel and sports. Finally, at the end, your... I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> Doyle and I have a podcast that we've done every week for a year and a half. A year and a half. So I actually have a sense of who he is. He actually has more than 25 years of experience in communications, marketing, and public relations. Doyle's been with Metzger Associates since 2005 when he founded the Social Media Practices Group, parentheses, yes, in 2005, close parent and currently serves as President and Chief Operating Officer. So, one of the things we all have in common is that we're all from Colorado, which also means that we all are extremely appreciative of the fact that when we left yesterday, it was about 25 degrees and blizzardy. Right, and now it is gorgeous outside. So, with that, our topic is promoting your blog in the age of social media. Now, I'm gonna be a little loose in the definition of blog, and social media, but we're going to be very narrow with the definition of age. <laughs> so, starting thoughts. Doyle. You're, you're on a roll today. I know. Come on, keep going. Um, yeah, let's, uh, I want to kick it off with, I think, one of my biggest pet peeves here, in that uh, just because social media, you don't have to write a check to Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or pick your poison once a week or once a month or every time you log on, it's not free, all right? Every minute you spend doing something in your business needs to, to be moving toward a goal. And if you're not thinking about it, you're not measuring it, you're not deciding where your audience is and, and looking for a way that you can improve your communications within these communities and selecting the right communities. Not every community is for every blog. You are wasting your time, you are wasting other people's time, and you are becoming online spam. So I, I, I guess I'd, I'd kind of like to throw that out as the baseline is, you know, just because you can get a username and password for free doesn't mean you have to play. Great. Josh? Um, I'm actually going to agree with that. You, you know, you, you see so many folks out there who think they have to go get set up on every single social network and spend their time and energy um, on those networks building a presence, but you just can't. There's too many out there. There's a new one popping up all the time. And um, it's, it's really important that you focus uh, your energies um, you know, outside of speaking about promoting your blog, but just in general, you know, you really want to focus your energy on those networks that are going to be relevant to you, your blog, and your business. Otherwise, you know, as, as he said, you're, you're just wasting your time. Right. Uh, well, to piggyback on what they're saying, 
I think it's also really important to actually think about strategy and obviously with blogging, there's personal blogging and there's business blogging and sometimes that's actually blended and especially for business blogging and, and even business marketing on social media, all too often people are really focused on the tactics and they don't understand the strategy or even think about the fact of tying it, as, as Doyle was saying, to your business goals and that you have to start with your business goals, go back to your resources of time, people, and money, and as Doyle was saying, time is money. And, and skills, too. Yeah. You know, if, if you can't write, maybe you should rethink a blog. Right. You know, or find somebody who can help you. And if well, that leaves out a lot of people, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and along with that, I think that that's the first place to start, is what do you like to do? And, and no, and if, if you're a CEO, or you're an entrepreneur, and you're not a writer, and you're not a communicator, then you need to find out somebody, find out, find someone on your team that that's actually what they want to do, because if you have to do it, you won't do it often, and you won't do it well, and it's actually gonna hurt you more than, than help you. Janine, I'm letting you have the last word. The last word, when does, when does the women ever get the last word, right? So we not have to today. enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> I figured as much. Um, I guess for, <laughs> one of the things that I just kind of really wanted to share was actually something that happened to me this week as well, which is, you know, I, I posted a tweet to try and help a newbie who had some questions about affiliate marketing, and the next thing I know I was getting spammed by everyone who had put the word affiliate as a search term and had automated that if they saw this word, I was going to get a tweet telling me that I should buy their program. I've been doing affiliate marketing for 12 years. I don't think buying somebody who's brand new to the blocks program for 99 bucks is going to help them with it. So just because something can be automated and always in the school and you can reach a lot of people at once, it's not necessarily the best idea to do it. You know, so, and as I looked at the people that were doing that to me and took a look at what their thread was, every single post that they had on their threads, and for some of them it came through on Facebook, for some it came through on Twitter, it was just the same thing. At somebody, you'll love my book, you know. There's no way that they're establishing any kind of a relationship with their audience. And I think that that, especially if you're trying to promote your blog and really create a community, which is where social media is going to help you the most, you want to be able to establish a personality. You want to be able to create some sort of a relationship with them. And making every single one of your posts something that's promotional is going to make people crazy and they're not going to be your friends. And they're not going to go tell other people to come visit your blog because you're making them nuts. So be positive and... Give, give the information is valuable. Exactly. We, social media is, is it's social media, all right? It's, it's the way you act in public. If you walk around tonight, we're all going to go to the icon at 8 o'clock, and if you walk around tonight and every single person you walk up to you say, hi, I have a software program, it's $99. Hi, I have an e-book, it's $4.50. You are going to be that guy, and people are going to be politely excusing themselves at first and then asking you to leave in a few minutes. Don't act like that on Twitter or on Facebook or on your blog or any place else. It doesn't work. It's true. So I'm curious, how many people in the room have a blog that they use for business purposes? Okay, blog world, less than half. Hmm. So how many of you are using like a Facebook fan page or something for business purposes? How many of you Google Plus? Tricky, tricky. Twitter? So there are people that didn't raise their hand at all. Hmm. So that's, that's interesting. So maybe MySpace, anyone MySpace? <laughs> <laughs> Was there, I mean, was there anybody there who was using exclusively Facebook or Twitter or G Plus instead of a blog? Right. Well, and that's, I think that's, that's one of the first things we can get into is one of the things that I think is really important to talk about is the evolution of blogging. And, you know, 10 years ago, blogging didn't exist. People were doing things like creating cheesy web pages on, on Angel Fire. Thank you for that reminder. Um, and AOL actually was a well-known acronym at that point. <laughs> Sorry if anyone's from AOL here. Um, things change. And one of the things that I think is becoming um, quite visible is that blogging per se, as a sort of standalone entity, is, is sort of moving along there. And I think that we're starting to see some of the social media sites overtake it. Again, you know, Facebook has how many uptone zillion people that are on it? Like 800 million now or something? Um, Google Plus is zooming along with its membership. Twitter has, I think, long since jumped the shark 
and that's a whole separate discussion that we can have a little later. Um, but where do you guys think blogging is going in terms of it being a component in social media? And absolutely, if any of you have an opinion, jump up and, and put your two cents in too. Just because these guys are behind this table doesn't mean your opinion isn't at least as important or valuable. No offense, guys. Well, I'll take offense, I don't care. <laughs> no, you're right. I think it, we're starting to see all of this evolve very much like traditional media in some ways. You know, tell, you know, what was the old saying that the word count of the average uh, television news broadcast was approximately three-fourths of the word count of the front page of the New York Times? And it was just the difference of the medium. It's, you know, TV news is 90 seconds, move on to the next thing. The New York Times is daily news. Then you had news magazines like Time that could do four and five and six and seven thousand word pieces and really crawl into it. And that's really what we're seeing here. You know, fake Twitter is, here's a one-sentence thought. Facebook here is a one-paragraph thought. And my blog is, here's four or five hundred words that I can get out there and think about. So it's, if you think about it again, it's, it's another one of my pet peeves is that one size fits all thing. I mean, Hootsuite is a wonderful thing. I use it every day. But, God, I hate to follow people that they, they tie their Facebook to their Twitter to their LinkedIn to their blog to their Flickr to their Tumblr to their, God, it's like reruns. And it drives me to utter distraction. Wait, where else does that work? Where, you, you can't take a TV show, knock the pictures out and put it on the radio and go, hey, we're, we're good to go. It doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that way in this, in this series of, of outlets as well. And, and I think there's an, an additional component to it, um, and that's the ownership of your content. Um, you know, a, a lot of folks, and the reason I asked my question before was because I wanted to lead to this a little bit. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people who, who are moving from their own blogs to Facebook exclusively or, or Twitter to, to generate leads, and, and they're doing okay. There are people who are doing okay. Um, but, you know, when you do that, you no longer have full ownership, it's, it's my opinion, um, of your content because you know, on your blog, you can write what you want. Nobody's going to take it down unless you're doing copyright theft. Whatever, it's a subject. But, uh, you know, you own it. Now, once you start distributing to Facebook and Google and everything else, which you should be doing in, in some way, shape, or form, um, suddenly you lose some control. And so I, I think that's one of the components that, that's important to, to consider um, when promoting your company um, that having a blog is something that you actually have full control over that blog, but you don't have full control on Facebook. They may say, see you later. You know, uh, what was it, YouTube kicked uh, Darren Rouse off, I guess. You know, he had one of the big bloggers, you guys I'm sure have all heard of him. He got booted from YouTube. You know, that's, that's kind of crazy to think of, but he then lost control because the content wasn't on his site. He's now lost his control. He got it back, but... Um, I think it's important that everybody keep in mind that, that you really want to make sure that you do own your content in, in some form. You know, I think one of the other things that, that I've been watching happening with blogging, which makes me happy, is that the quality of the writing continues to improve. Um, as Dave mentioned, one of the blogs that we've got is actually a travel blog. And I've been a travel writer for like 15 years now. And I've kind of watched that it's a lot of people started blogging about travel, and you'll see it in other industries as well. It was kind of all the wannabes. In our case, it was all the wannabes who wanted free trips, you know, so they were going to write about it. It wasn't that too cool. But a lot of the writing was really bad. You know, they didn't understand how to kind of convey what things are. Now you're seeing that better and better writers are coming into the industry, and kind of the cream of the crop is rising to the top. Those are the ones that are are not just writing wonderfully, but they're also kind of how to master social media, how to do either guest posts or comments that are that are related and intertwining to help build their blogs in, in the first place by working with other people on there. So, you know, the quality continues to improve and there's networking that's going on online. The same as we're all networking here. I mean, that's why we came to this show is to meet other people and talk and share. You can do that online. And if you keep thinking about it, thinking about it as building a relationship, then you're going to find that that's going to help your blog to grow. So I find this interesting because the question I asked was what's evolving in terms of blogs becoming more present on social media sites like Facebook and Google Plus. And what I heard you guys say was, oh, blogging is still really important. Fair? So how many people in this room believe that within the next couple of years this show won't be called Blog World at all? Because blogs will have become relatively, they will morph into something new or different. So. Um, it's an interesting difference there, and, and I completely agree with you because 
You know, when I think about things like doing a Google search, have you ever done a Google search and the search result is an article someone wrote on Facebook? Or the search result is a Google Plus entry someone used as a status update? It's, it's starting to happen slowly in terms of social circles, but that's a very slow to, to arrive thing. And if you really want to have your content, then I really see the center of the universe being your blog, and then all the other social media being these satellites that are pointing people hopefully in after getting enough of the sampling. Well, now, and I, I would say, Dave, even what a blog is, is, is evolving dramatically. I mean, it used to be you had your web page or your website, it was kind of around the brochure, and then the blog kind of moved over here. And, and now, I, I know for our company, the blog's kind of the centerpiece of our website. And there's a few static pages with our address on them, so that doesn't change, and, and that's fine. But the, the real meat of what's going on is the blog itself, and that's really become the website. And I, I, I don't think the two are, are separate anymore, and, and I think the days of the static web page, well, I mean, and Google's forcing our hand on this with their search algorithms, quite honestly, a static web page is not going to be successful. I'm sorry I interrupted. No. <laughs> That's your job. Yes, so, comments, anyone, observations, disagreements, agreements, come on, we're just sitting here, so you guys need to start engaging. So can I ask you to step up to the mic, please, if you don't mind? Oh, you're not allowed to leave. Hold on, hold on. Just so you can't leave. You didn't raise your hand. <laughs> no, I'm totally kidding. You can leave if you want to leave. It's totally fine. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was your name? <laughs> really, everyone tweet. <laughs> Way to kill a buzz there. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Pictures of cats. <laughs> Pictures of cats. <laughs> Let her finish that question. And part of it is some people want to attract readers to their blog and the website to get projects. Some people want to do it to get dollars, marketing. So it's sort of two different things. I don't know if you can kind of approach it that way. Do you mind, Dave? Because you and I have had this conversation a lot. Because Dave, Dave and I have, have blogged, both have blogs. And we do them for very different reasons. I, I mean, uh, completely. But Dave has a lot more page views and sells ads on his blog. I write a blog to drive business for my public relations firm. So you you actually absolutely that question, in my opinion, nailed the crux of what we want to talk about. What's your objective? If you want a million visitors a month so Google AdWords will write you a big check, that's a, it's a great objective. Go for it. But understand that you're going to have a different set of tactics and applications than somebody that wants to write to establish to be a thought leader. So one of the great things that Dave and I talk about a lot is, I hope everybody on the planet steals my stuff, gives me attribution to it, and puts it all over the place. Because the more people that read it will hire my PR firm, right? That will drive Dave to utter distraction. He needs original, unique copy on his site to drive the traffic there. Both perfectly admirable goals, just very different. And so understand what you're trying to accomplish. That was a great question. And, and more to Doyle's point, I, I think, um, it, it, you know, there are sites like, like StumbleUpon where you can get a ton of traffic, absolute ton of traffic. The question is, is that traffic of any value to you whatsoever? Is it targeted? Is it, uh, is it the users who actually care about your company, your business, your product? Or is it just junk traffic that's, you know, eyeballs? Eyeballs are great. We all want to brag about how many people come to our site. But if it's worthless traffic, bounce rate's high, and they don't stick around and they're not going to buy from you or they're generate a lead or, or something else, then what's the point? I'm curious, how many people in here that blog blog for thought leadership? How many people here blog that are not doing it for thought leadership? Okay, so almost everyone does. So if it's thought leadership you're looking for, and I think it's kind of the crux of the title of the, um, the panel, is that there's your blog and it's part of this whole ecosystem of social media. And you need to be taking what you're doing with your blog and promoting it on the other networks, but also building up your community with those networks. Again, if they're tied to your business goals and it makes sense. And for instance, if you're um, writing for your business and you write a post on a specific topic, you could use Twitter and other places to keyword that topic and find people having those conversations 
and start answering questions. You can use Google Answers to answer those questions. You can use Quora to answer those questions. You could go to Alltop and find blogs that are talking about similar things, and you could comment on other people's blog posts. And it kind of goes back to your business goals and your strategy. If, uh, if that's a big part of you getting your blog out and building your audience, those are the best ways to do it, is, is look at the different social networks that are out there, see which ones make sense, and for some posts they make, might make sense, and for another post they might not. And the challenge I think we all have is time. And there's no limit to what we can be doing. It's a matter of looking at those goals and our time and what's really gonna make the most sense. And for one person, going to uh, LinkedIn groups and LinkedIn questions, is going to drive a lot of the people that they want, and for other people, that's not going to be worthwhile at all. Right. I think an interesting example of this, actually, since we are in Los Angeles, is movies. So if you think about how movies are marketed and packaged up, is their goal is to get you to go and buy a ticket and go into the theater, or buy a DVD, whatever. So they have the movie itself, which is sort of like the blog entry. We'll run with this and see if it works. And then they have the preview, and the preview is like what you put on Twitter. The preview is what you might put on Facebook. And then they also have things like the making of, the 15 minutes, and then that goes on things like Comcast On Demand, the day the film's released, or often earlier. And so they're giving you the little sneak previews and the behind the scenes footage, but all they're doing is trying to be such, so interesting and so good at teasing you that you're like, well, I have to go see the whole film. I've just seen this. And so then the more you pay attention, the more you realize that as the film gets closer to release, the trailers start changing. And so they start to give you more and more footage. If you're really paying attention, by the time you get into the theater, you might have seen five or six minutes of footage already. And there's at least one film I can think of where they literally took the first five minutes of the movie and put it on YouTube. And they just said, here, watch the first few minutes. We know it's so interesting that you're going to just be sucked in and want to go to the theater to go see the rest of it. So to me, that's how I sort of visualize the, the connection between a blog and social media. And the thing again is that sometimes you want to make a short. You have a film that really is only four minutes long. So it's not about getting people to go into the theater. Now it's about look at what a good special effects house we have. Or look at how good this actor is. And that's when you have just exclusive content for Facebook or something like that. But so, so I'll throw that out as my metaphor. So Janine, how are you fitting all this together? How do you think about this? Well, you know, just kind of to try and answer your question as well. I mean, what I've seen that's been successful is to, to get out there with your personality and, and have a personality. Don't just be kind of someone who's got all the facts and the figures on whatever the particular topic is. But, you know, kind of show um, how to use those, how to incorporate them into something. Insert yourself into conversations in different places, but with good information that's not just all trying to promote yourself, but really kind of trying to serve whatever the answer, you know, whatever the question is to the community. And just if you're constantly being that resource, soon you become the expert. So if you want to become the thought leader on something, people have seen your name nine million times all over the place. Every time that they look up some article that's on a topic, there, there you are with the reply that's good, valuable information. And, you know, people will then naturally start looking for you. They're going to try and find your blog. They're going to try and come back and see what else you have to offer about that. And so, you know, I mean, I've, I've watched many, many people over the years who've been able to build their community, to build their blog, because they were always out there and being a good positive force. And, you know, and now especially when you've got things like Twitter, you know, it just, it, you know, I was talking before about automating. That's fine if you've got some search for some sort of keyword, but instead of just trying to sell your book or whatever, answer somebody's question or say, hey, this might work, you know, if it's, whether it's food, maybe this is a great recipe for chili or something, I don't know, whatever it is. You can think of it, you can adapt that to whatever your program is. But by doing that, I mean, social media, Twitter's amazing how fast you can get something out and everywhere, you know, in a heartbeat. Same thing with Facebook, same thing with LinkedIn, although each one kind of has a different audience, really, when you get into it. But, um, but the, the biggest thing is, I think more than anything, get out there. Let people see you. Let them get to know you and what's your passion. And that's going to come through. You know, I mean, if, if, if you just do that. I mean, I'm not kind of a business blogger like them. I tend to do more kind of, you know, consumer goods or events or whatever, something like that. And, you know, I mean, you get me to start talking about travel or about sports. Oh, my God, you're going to know that I'm a sportsaholic. I will confess. I know way more about sports than, like, probably 95%. 
women, but that's okay. Um, so, you know, but when I do that, that's what shows. People will talk to me for like 30 seconds and they're like, oh my God, you know more than you should probably in most cases. <laughs> but, but I think that that communicates and that kind of passion carries through in my tweets. Hopefully, you know, it does in my Facebook postings. It even shows up in LinkedIn, which to me is much more kind of like a business sort of thing as opposed to something where you'd normally go talk about sports or travel or some of those other things. But just, you know, if the passion comes through, people are going to remember you and they're going to come back and try and find you. So, you know, I mean, as far as building, I've watched that work a lot. I think it's important to remember um, psychologically behind what you're saying. People connect to people, people don't connect to companies. And they connect to a person and they think the person's cool and so that makes them think, okay, well, <laughs> if that person chooses to work at that company or that company is associated with them, I'll give them a shot. And um, this has been said in many places many times, but this social media is all about connection and validation. And that's how human beings are wired. We've been wired like that since cave people. We want to connect with people, and we want to be validated and have them go, oh, you're a cool person, and all that means is we like the same things. And that's kind of the magic of real-time search and Twitter and social media in general is now you can find your tribe. You can go find the people who care about what you care about. And um, Doyle, for instance, is a Cornhuskers fan. Really? We didn't know that. Fan, fan is a, <laughs> too soft of a word. <laughs> and that obviously has nothing to do with his company or his business. But it shows you him as a person. Well, and, and ironically, my, my PR firm is located in Boulder. All right, the University of Colorado has no love for the University of Nebraska in football. And I made the decision a long time ago that if you don't want to hire my firm because I cheer for a different college football team than you do, we're not going to get along very well over the long haul anyway. But Brett's point is well taken. I, I love college football. I, I mean. You guys aren't going to see me Saturday. I, I found the, color, the Californians for Nebraska. But let me just interject. I'll yes. not be here on Saturday because I went to Alabama, 5 o'clock. Alabama LSU rolled The up. national championship. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are you watching? Because I want to come watch your game too. So, but, but seriously, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. And, I mean, Dave and I one time, when the, I, the first iPad was coming out, Dave and I bantered on Twitter so bad about who had it first. Neither one of us had one early, by the way. We didn't. But I was getting Speak for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, you did. And, but we were just doing goofy stuff, but I was getting calls from companies saying, dude, if you'll just bring it over for, we won't tell anybody, we need to get a look at it, we got it. It's like, I don't have one. No, seriously, bring it over. No, we're <laughs> kidding, you know. But, but it showed the personality and it showed the fun, and I think that's so, so important. Dave, Dave's got one of the best tech blogs out there, but he's got personality to it, and that's why it's, that's why it's one of the best tech blogs out there. I want to jump back really quick to Dave's point about the movies and the trailers. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's also really important to, to keep in mind that who, who you're marketing to, particularly as, as a business vlogger, um, you know, with movie trailers, you're not going to watch a trailer to the Justin Bieber film, you know, on... Speak for yourself. <laughs> Joe, it was a much better film than you think it was. Just but, saying. Um, but, you know, so you, you know, they're marketing these films, they know where they're marketing. Right, so, so you're going to see trailers for sports movies on ESPN, right? You're going to see women's movies on Lifetime, that kind of thing. So the same goes for social media. You want to make sure that you're, you're speaking in, in the right neighborhood. You want, you know, if you're, if you're talking about, you know, your, your cereal brand and you're doing something, <coughs> you know, on, uh, in front of a group who, who likes to, you know, eat, eat bagels on the fly, well, they're not going to care. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're in a community, in a network, in a group, uh, on a site, on blogs, where, where the people actually care, otherwise it's just wasted breath. I used to marketing with, uh, with content, I think it's a really important thing to always remember is that we are people first, and we like to be entertained, as Dave said, and if you say or tweet anything that makes somebody laugh or smile, that should be kind of your, your number one goal. Because if you read a tweet and you see someone's face and you see their name and they wrote anything that made you laugh, automatically the little oxytocin goes off in your brain, which is a love chemical, which is the same thing going on for cocaine addicts, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> But it makes you feel good, Overheard. and so you're like. <laughs> so Twitter <laughs> so sponsored by you. <laughs> <laughs> you see someone's face, you see their name, 
and, and in the back of your brain, in your unconscious, you go, oh, that's a cool person, and it's a warm person. And um, anyone who's been on Twitter, especially you know, for three or four years or so, has probably had the experience of someone coming up to them at a conference, or if you're in a smaller town in a coffee shop, and saying, hi, I follow you on Twitter. And it's creepy. It, it's creepy. And it's, I, I was in radio years ago, and that would happen because I'd get on stage in front of bands, and people knew my face. And it was weird when it happened 20 years later on Twitter. And it's because you feel permission. If someone made you smile or laugh, you see them six months later, and even though you've never met them in person before, it's cool to come up and say, oh, I met you on Twitter, and that's kind of like the equalizer of like, okay, you're not a stalker or a creepy person, let's just say hello. Probably your face. Our fabulous, <laughs> bold, adventurous attendee speak. <laughs> so I want to get your thoughts on do you think that people are getting engagement fatigue? Are there too many places, you know, we're trying to get comments on our, on our blog, we're connecting with them on Twitter. Are, are people kind of getting tired of engaging and trying to get engagement? What, what are your thoughts on how to combat this? Okay, hang on. Raise your hand if you think that that's accurate. That people are just sort of getting a little tired of all this social media stuff. Okay, cool. So, jump in. How, how many channels? You know, if, if you guys want to raise your hands, maybe we could take a, a poll here. How many channels do you guys connect on? You know, blog, you know, blog. So one, two, you know, uh, blog, Google Plus, Facebook, Twitter, yeah. you know, YouTube, 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 YouTube. you know, now, can you, can you focus on one, two, five, seven, ten networks? How many can you focus on? I focus on three at most. I can't focus on anymore. I know that. If I tried anymore, I, there would be no value in what I provided in any of those networks. So yeah, I think that's something else that maybe you know, these guys can talk about a little bit. So then what I'm hearing you say is that, yes, you agree that there is this sort of engagement fatigue and that the way you're addressing it is that even though there's lots and lots of social networks, and you didn't mention Orca, what up? Um, that you just focus on a small number of them. Okay. Did you guys, is this a common strategy here? It's got to be. I mean, because, I mean, there's... But, you know, if you look at the, the add this button, you've got words of 40 different things you can add this to. That's the um, slim version. Of yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Yeah. And, yeah, I think you've got to pick what works for you personally and professionally. It's coming back to that objective thing again. And, I mean, think about it like your cable box at home. I mean, I get 140 channels or something crazy like that. I think I watch five. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I get the Nashville network. I don't know where it is. I don't care. And, and that's that's not any problem with that, but it's you just got to... You've got a finite amount of attention and, and then do it where it makes you feel good and, and, and you get something out of it. Alrighty, so I'm going to clarify something that, in my opinion, the key isn't what you're comfortable with and what you enjoy, the key is where's your audience. Mm -hmm. So if you're a band, you might, I hate to say it, you might have to be on MySpace. MySpace, you're right. You know, yeah, no, there's, let's, let's you laugh, and there's still some pretty <laughs> impressive numbers there. Yeah, you, can, you can tweet me on that one. Yeah. And let, but let's divide that too. There's, you know, it was funny, so, somebody asked me the other day and challenged me, said, well, what's the business objective for your podcast with Dave Taylor and, and Michael? And I said, I don't care, it's fun. And that's okay too. I, I, I don't go on I mean, Facebook. We have a business objective. Yeah. Oh, hell, I never got that memo. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and there it is. But it was, it's okay. I, you know, for your business, you should focus on moving your business forward. But it's so if if you dig MySpace, go hang out there, have a good time. Everybody needs a hobby, right? So. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I do agree with you. I think that people are starting to burn out. I know, you know, I was excited when Google Plus came out and kind of checked it out and you know created a few circles, and then it seemed like all I was getting were like spammers. People from you know some foreign country who's you know now I'm in one of their circles. Oh goody, who the heck are you? Why are you contacting me? You know there was no relationship there, and honestly now it's just every time I get a new notice it's like delete, 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 and you know because they're not ever names that I ever know, and I'm not going to try and start a conversation with them because they're not relevant to me at all. You know so I have I have my favorites for me in my industry. You know it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's LinkedIn. And LinkedIn comes third, although I don't know that everybody in my industry would agree with me on that, but for me it is. And beyond that, you know, I'll get invitations to join new things, and I don't, because I don't have time. You know, my life is so busy, I don't have time to go on there and learn how to use one more format and build all of my relationships on there and stuff. We've got some good things that are already in place. That's where 
follow up what Josh is saying. That's where my audience is. Those are the people that I need to make sure I keep active in my life. So that's, you know, that's one thing that's going to be important as you're trying to build your blog, is see where your people are coming from. You know, what is it that they respond to? You know, if you've got that many different like buttons on there, which ones are they hitting and which ones are they completely ignoring? Get rid of the ones that ignored because all they're doing is distractions. And we've got enough distractions in our life. So, you know, I think that that's important to do is just kind of funnel and focus because otherwise you're going to make people nuts. Starting with yourself. And that's a short trip for me, so. <laughs> Brent? Next question. Can you guys share some specific examples of social media endeavors that you guys have undertaken that actually failed and you know, hopefully failed miserably? You know, it didn't work out, you know, as, as, as you had I said this really overpriced client. <laughs> I've never failed, no. Um, I think, I, actually, I'll tell a story and I'll leave the client out because that's not fair. Um, and it was, we argued, we lost, and it, and it happened. We had a client who, we went back to them and said, your audience for this particular niche, this was in the automotive industry, exists on YouTube and on these about seven or eight blogs that have massive traffic and really cool. We want a Facebook page. No, you don't need a Facebook page. Nobody's talking about what it is that you do. On Facebook. We've looked. They're not. Let's keep an eye on it. And if you want to just build a page and throw it out there, fine, but don't put a lot of time. No, we want a Facebook. And long story short, they ended up ignoring YouTube and ignoring these seven or eight key blogs and putting all their money and time and effort into Facebook, and the product failed miserably. I mean, it, it was epic fail, right? It was, should be on fail block. It was so bad. And it was it's a huge company with a huge budget. And it was just somebody, some executive said, I want one of those Facebook things. And damn it, they were gonna put that peg in that hole no matter what shape it was. And it didn't it didn't work. They it, they lost their lunch on that one. Did they learn from it? I don't think so, sadly. I, I, I don't I don't So the question was, did they learn from yeah, it? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, did they learn from it? Um, I don't see dramatically improved behavior. And uh, we, we have uh, not pushed to continue the relationship, let's put it that way. Anyone else? Come again. I, mean, I, I, I tried a little experiment um, earlier. 50 bucks, uh, register 50 bucks coming your way. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. All right, who's the winner? Nice. Oh. No, no, someone, you can just, you can, you, no, can, we'll switch it. you can do it, you can do it anonymously, donate it to a worthy cause. I have a square. Right back. <laughs> I, I conducted a little experiment um, where I went to a couple of the uh, LinkedIn groups that are larger LinkedIn groups in, in the uh, real estate investing niche, and I asked a question. And, um, you know, this is, is kind of different, but, but um, you know, the feedback I got was, was fairly worthless, and not to promote what we do, but... Um, a little bit. Um, you know, I asked the same question on Bigger Pockets and uh, my site, and, and we, we, I got answers and I got feedback. Um, so while there are groups on LinkedIn, you know, what it taught me is there are groups on LinkedIn that might be very large, but is there value in spending my time and energy asking questions, <coughs> questions there? And what I learned was no. And, and I had never really tried that before. I, mean, I didn't really play too much with those groups before. And now they're gone because I know it's a complete waste of my energy. I have a similar story, but... Just one time, okay. blog world. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and, and tied into that, I will say also, as someone who has written literally over 4,000 blog entries across different sites, is it's really, really hard to anticipate which ones are going to be popular. And this is something where I wish I could just finally figure out that secret formula. If you just have this thing, or a cat, or someone with an overly short skirt, or something, you just know you're going to get a lot of comments, or you get a lot, a lot of traffic. But there's no formula, and it just seems to be you just have to sort of plug away and really be earnest about what you're doing and, and spread it out there and, and keep your fingers crossed. And we'll go right into your question. Hi, so I actually have two questions. I'm sorry, um, just one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so I'm looking to launch a blog for my company, and the direction I've been given is that it has to be industry-facing and customer. Um, so my question. So like you're already set up to be Janus now because you have two faces. It's already confusing. So keep going. Um, so my question is, um, how do I engage the industry side? Um, and secondly, how do I create this blog so that 
industry people who come and see customer-facing articles don't immediately leave, and vice versa. Yeah, Go. Uh, I mean, I, I would. Uh, I would mix it. I, I, you know, we we do that, and and so, you know, in order to attract the, the industry folks, you want to have smart commentary on what's happening in the industry. You want to talk about what's going on. You want to become that thought leader in the industry. So, you know, when news breaks, you guys want your opinions heard. You want your thoughts um, listened to. Um, but when it comes to, to facing uh, the consumer, you want to put out educational content. Evergreen content, which Dave can talk about, we can all talk about. But uh, evergreen content that that's going to help the consumer understand the product, understand the industry uh, a little bit better. So if if you do a mix, you know I think you're good. If if you do too much of one or too much of another, you might turn off one side or the other side. And, and there's there's kind of a fine line, and I guess you just have to play around and figure it out. But well, and I would say too, think carefully about how how you name your categories and how you organize your categories. So if I'm an industry person, I say, you know, they, and I'll give you a great example. There's a, there's a VC in, in Boulder, a guy named Brad Felt, and he is a prolific blogger. But he, I would say I care about one out of every four of his posts because he's a big 24 fan and I don't care. And he went out to dinner with his wife, Amy, and I don't care. And here's the 10 things I look for in, his, in a business plan. I care deeply, all right? So Brad does a good job of organizing that. So I, I, if I go to his blog, I'm not turned off. I can say, oh, what was that thing? And I can scroll, and I can do that. So I think if you if you kind of take that same approach, that you can be a little bit schizophrenic, but if somebody's looking for something in particular, if you give them a path with, through some good user interface, um, I think that can be very helpful as well. And don't get hung up. I think that the mix is important, and it's 50-50. And, and, and there are some things where you can look at the questions that your customers are having, and there might be a post out of that that's helping them, but it actually is showing your industry expertise and, and it's helping you there too. Um, but don't get hung up on one particular post or a couple of posts because it doesn't matter, it goes away. Like Doyle's saying, if it's not, if someone goes by and they see four different posts and three of them they don't care about and one of them they do, then you provided some value and they're gonna care. And people don't, pay as much attention to the things that they don't like as much as you would think. They just kind of skip over it. We're all, all of us have limited bandwidth and just think about yourself and what you do. And if you read, if you're flipping through someone's blog because you ended up there for some reason and you look at 10 titles and even one out of the 10 speaks to you, you don't even think about those other nine. You're diving into that one and if you find value in that, you're, you're gonna come back to the blog. Right, and I'm gonna add another point here too is that this to me reminds me of the discussion of B2B versus B2C. And my take on that is that there is no difference because businesses become one of your consumers. Thank you, Doyle. Um, so, so the whole thing is you're saying that you want to be industry facing and customer facing. I'll suggest that's the same thing. And that the people that are in your industry are already acolytes, they're already evangelists, they're already excited about this, they already want this stuff in their houses. They already want this stuff on their office walls. You know, these are the companies that are already doing smart grid and are already tracking all this stuff in the solar industry. And so they are your customers, even though what they're buying might be, you know, your company itself, or they might be buying some large industrial product that you can then roll out across 10,000 homes or something. But I don't see that there's such a big difference. And I think that there's a lot of companies where their whole approach is, well, we have the companies that we work with and that's just fundamentally different to how we're gonna interact with our customers. And I think that's a mistake. And I think it sets it up where you have this duality that is hard to absorb. It's hard to understand. It's just like, well, this is not for me. I can't read this trade publication. Well, and the other thing I think we have to remember too, I, I probably follow 200 blogs and I maybe visit two a week, go to their actual site. The rest of it rolls in through an RSS feed for the most part. So unless you're, again, somebody like Dave, that I need, I need your eyeballs, so I'm only going to give you a couple of sentences and then make you click through to my site to read the rest of it, a lot of, the, a lot of this is just going to be a part of somebody's stream, and if they like what they see and they see it, I don't mind. And that's, you know, Brad Feld's a great example. I, I go past him before, I go past him with Amy, and there's a nice business one, or there's a, something on legislation that he's talking about. It, it, you know, I don't even go, I, I can't think of the last time I visited Feld.com. So. But, but to get there, you, you know, you, you had to have gone there and found content content that was of right, some value. Exactly. If if that yeah. content is not there, if you go to somebody's site and there is no value, you're not going to come back. 
You're right. not, and even if you see that guy somewhere tweeting or, or right. Facebooking, you're going to say, oh, yeah, I was there. It was garbage. And, and you're sure as heck not going to click on the RSS feed and add it to your reader. Right. right. And so, for whatever it's worth, if I could just add one more thing in here. I, I actually was in a similar situation. I was working for a company that was generating insurance leads. And so we were supposed to try and get new insurance agents to sign up, plus we were supposed to try and get consumers to go through the service. And what I felt found to be very, very helpful for me was to go through, believe it or not, you know, what the searches were on the site and try and figure out. And I really did find clusters of, of questions, you know, where they were all about kind of a similar topic. And I, and I could tell from that that in some cases it was both the insurance agent and the consumer who were both trying to ask the same question, just modifying it a little bit differently. So there might be some things you can find that, that will multi-purpose, you know, and depending on how you write it, you can be speaking to both audiences. Um, you know, or be able to target that way, and then, you know, kind of saying what they're saying. It's okay to kind of mix up content, and it's still going to be valuable to them if you can talk to this group has this question, and this group has that question, and, you know, and both will, will win. So, for me, that was huge. You yeah. get the chance. That's great, and you've been very patient. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, I had a question about, basically, the, uh, we have a blog we launched uh, this year, and we've been in the industry for a while. We actually started doing web design in 96. And uh, so we've been able to successfully drive about a lot of people on the blog. And we've had great engagement on the blog. And uh, you know we're noticed by a lot of companies already in San Diego. And it's a, it's a blog about social activities and information about San Diego. One thing is that we're trying to do is improve the engagement on Facebook. And uh, one of the things that we do very well is email marketing. So even though it's not considered, you know, like a primary social channel anymore, but we think it's very social, it's very relevant for us. And we're trying to do the same thing with Facebook, and we've had suggestions like, hey, start a photo contest, or maybe run a contest, or sweepstakes, or something like that. So I'm looking for some thoughts on how we can get more people engaged on Facebook and perhaps Twitter. Well, I'm almost going to turn that back to you, and, and I'm not going to say you shouldn't do that, but. There's a part of me that almost wants to say why. If you if you've got a great interactive email list and your site's being well visited and you're hitting your goals, I would say you want to think about how do I use Facebook and Twitter to continue to move you know the rising tide floats all the boats, as opposed to I, I went through this with a client that was actually doing just the opposite. They had this vibrant, huge, wonderful Facebook community. How do I get them back to my site? You know, it, it, if if I go to the mixer tonight at eight and I see you across the room, I go, hey, come here. It's not going to work. I, if I want to chat with you, I need to walk over to where you are. And I think it's okay to, to let your community tell you where they want to play and then engage them and play there. And if they like emails, man, let it go. And, and then continue to look at, okay, is Facebook growing? What can I do? Does this work on Facebook? Is this helping all of my business together as opposed to I'm not doing very well on Facebook? I don't know. Who cares? Mark Zuckerberg, maybe. I don't you know. But Mark's on Google Plus. So it's okay. That's what I hear. <laughs> so any, anyone else? He's in our circle. That was sort of a nice um, response. Is, I mean, is, is it making you money is the question, I think. Yeah, yeah we're actually doing it as a concept. We're not trying to make money on it. But we actually got a sponsor, which was actually a very good fit. So, yeah, so now you are making money. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> it, it never hurts. Like they were saying before, you know, the humor is a lot of fun to do. And, and giving people a reason to have fun. You're going to be remembered for that, and people will, will follow you on that. So if you can do it without like hurting any other part of your business, I don't think it's a bad thing to do. I think it's a lot of fun, and you know you can get some great pictures. I mean, you get the silly dressed dog pictures, or the you know, here's my little cardboard man visiting, you know, the San Diego Zoo or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can play with and have a theme to it and have an ultimate purpose for it, and and I think it can work out very very well. And, and help everything to grow along there. And the worst that happens is people have a lot of fun and they talk about you for a little while. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, think, think of the keynote that we were listening to earlier today where he was talking about how, you know, all of a sudden he gets this call from the Howard Stern show just out of the blue. You never know where something like that is going to lead. So it doesn't sound like you're risking anything in doing this and it, you're not putting all your eggs in that proverbial basket that this is going to make you grow and, you know, it's going to succeed and then we're going to be a hit. You're already there. So now it's just kind of one of those things that, that keeps some activity and some energy in there. So I think it's a great idea to be able to do it. If you've got a sponsor for it, it sounds like you don't have any risk. Have fun. We're, we're doing a contest right now. Health One is one of our clients in Denver, and they, they have six, seven hospitals, 14 clinics, all sorts of things. And we're doing a Facebook contest for them called Baby Faces. 
So if you have a child that was born at a Health One hospital, you can put the picture on Facebook, and they bought two electronic billboards in the Denver metro area, and each week, uh, several of the winning, winning pictures go up on the billboard. Oh my God. I, I think people are cheating. There's no way that- Did you really just say so OMG? <laughs> can someone please tweet, Doyle just said OMG. I cannot believe. I've got somebody working on baby faces damn near full time. I mean, it's just, it's gone berserk. And, you know, you just, it, and I, I kind of had a sneaking suspicion it might have been popular, but I had no idea what it could be like. So if you hit on something like that and it works, great. But I, I guess where I was saying is like, don't ignore Facebook, but don't stress over it. If, you, if it's not where your audience wants to play, that's okay. But if you do open up that channel and you are going to do something like a photo contest, that's one campaign, and you don't want to be Old Spice that puts so many resources into something that's awesome, and then two months later you go to the Twitter account and there's crickets. So if you do do that and you see success, you don't necessarily have to keep things up at that level, but you should at least be making sure that at least on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, that you can't do three times a day, which would be optimum for Facebook. You're, you are giving people a reason to be there, or if they stumble on it, they don't look and say, oh, they haven't been here since June. Um, and I, I just might redirect something back on that comment. Um, a lot of that stuff's hit or miss, and, and I'm not a, in the PR you know, firm world, but you know, I, I would believe that. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you get a hit like that. I mean, you're not going to get that hit every single time, right? So, exactly. So, so to retain that consistency isn't as easy as we all think it is. Right? It, yeah, and I think Brett's point's well taken. Though. I mean, yeah, it's, we've got this ridiculous spike in traffic and stuff's going on, and I don't expect that to continue. And so that's actually part of the client management is to say, okay, this went crazy this month. Don't look at me and go, what are we going to do next month to get 20% more? Because I don't know what the answer is. It's kind of like what Dave was saying. I Sometimes blog posts just get a life of their own, and sometimes you, you spend a, a week working on something you think is you know just the, the greatest thing ever, and it's nobody cares. <laughs> and you just never know. It's, it's timing, it's what's going on in the world, and it's all sorts of stuff. Um, you just gotta, you gotta keep doing quality stuff out there and keep your audience engaged, and understand that not everybody likes everything, and it's, that's okay. Just and, don't turn them off. And when, when that happens, because I've had blog posts where I just thought, oh my God, it's the best thing I ever wrote. Crickets, you know, you can't take it personally. You know, you can think it's wonderful and that's okay and just be happy with yourself because otherwise, so, oh, so, God, so are you guys implying like the crickets have their social network? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you could always repurpose those posts. You know, if you, you've got something that died, come back to it in six months, eight months and try repurposing it. I mean, you can always, or, or tweet it in, you know, a week or two and, and see if maybe timing was bad. I mean, you never know. Yeah. One thing Jason Falls always says about content. Okay, because it ties into that is um, he he likes to talk about his most popular blog posts he's ever had were the ones where he felt pressure like I just have to get something out and he literally like didn't want to hit the send button because he's like this is absolute crap it's it's, it's shit and I, I don't want my name attached to it but I don't have anything else I gotta send it and then the next day it blows up and he's like and he said he still doesn't know he's you know, something that blew up a year ago, he still hasn't figured out why that worked. So it's more important to be consistent and have something out there because the audience might show up for something that you totally think is crap. Hi. 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 Thanks um, for your patience. Absolutely. So I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on where all of this is going. Um, Dave, you, you sort of alluded to, you know, the blog is... Is, is now the central hub versus the, the static web page. But what will, the, what will the platform be for content? Maybe the word isn't blog or blogging, but we still want to own our space and the great writers you know, rise to the top. So where is it going? What does it look like? All right, I predict we're going back to MySpace, personally. <laughs> <laughs> Hell in a handbasket. Uh, no, no. Janine, you want to go first? Come on, I'll put you on the spot. You are Where's this all going? Um, I think that blogs will always be there because I think that it's something that has now found its its place. I don't know if they're going to continue to have new ones incessantly, um, or you know, some of the people that are starting blogs now, their only readers will be their mom, you know, and and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but you know, I think that they need to that new bloggers need to ex to manage their expectations. I guess in that respect, um, unless they've really got a vision 
about it. So I think that that's, that's more important, is that when you see that it's, it's your passion, as I was talking before, to me, passion is the thing that always shows through. And that's what, when I'm trying to read somebody else's content, I want to see that. I want to see that they love their topic, and they're going to tell me about it. And honestly, I will read about like long-term care health insurance, or something else that's like unbelievably boring. I mean, could be a guaranteed cure for insomnia, but if somebody's passionate about it, and you know that they're doing this because that's what saved their grandma, or something like that, I'll read it, because I can have that come through. So that's what I think is going to carry through, is that more and more people's individual personalities are going to show up, and as a result, the blogs will stay strong, and you know the kind of the, some of the social media things that are pointing to those blogs and bringing you there are are going to carry that through. People are, are getting better and better at tweeting. I mean, think of how you know when we were first starting on tweeting, nobody knew what they were doing. That 140 characters was just like a waste. It was just gibberish. And now you can get three words, and you know exactly what somebody's talking about, and you're right there to their site. So. I think that things are going to continue to evolve and that, that more and more people are learning how to use kind of some of the mediums and perfect that and as a result it's all just going to keep growing for the people that really take the time to learn their craft. Okay, since we're running out of sand in our Sorry. hourglass, do any of you guys disagree with what Jimmy just said? Because if you don't, then we don't, we're going to keep moving. I, 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 I want to dial oh, it in just hold a little on, bit. Hold on, Brett. Oh, Brett, Brett. Brett. Um, I just think it's important to, to see how the definition is changing for a blog too, whereas Tumblr is rising so quickly and it's kind of something in between Twitter and in between what we n normally consider blogs and then there's what different generations respond to for blogs and the fact that we're, we're in this content heavy uh, environment that just keeps getting heavier and heavier so the signal noise is getting harder and harder. Um, what Janine says is true, and the, and the personalities and the passion are what are going to shine through. But people's bandwidth is getting shorter, and there may be one generation that is still reading a lot of blogs, and there's other generations that are just looking at pictures on Tumblr. But to them, that's the, it's still a blog to, to each one of those audiences. I, I think what, what is not going to go away, and what's going to continue to evolve, is just the two-way conversation. Um, I, I think. People's burning desire to have their own blog platform to do whatever they do. I think that's going to wane a little bit. I mean, there's 200 million blogs tracked by Technorati. I guarantee you, 100 million of them have one post that says "Hi, welcome to my blog." You know, check back here for frequent updates, and they forgot the password. You know, it's like, you know, give me a break. There's not 200 million active, thoughtful blogs going out there. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to comment. One of my favorite examples in mainstream media is. There's a guy that's on the number one news station in Denver that carries the Broncos. His, his name's Lou from Littleton. And he's got his own sports talk show weekly now because he started as a frequent caller to the other sports talk guys and said such cool, thoughtful, funny stuff. And he had this passion and personality for the Broncos that gave him his own show. And I think we're going to see more of me being a frequent contributor to TechCrunch or the Apple weblog or whatever it is and less Doyle's blog about Apple. How many more blogs do we need about Apple? But if I've got thoughtful things to say, we're now evolving to the point where people can say, I just want to see this guy's comments. Okay, we have two minutes left. Hold, hold on. So, you have a question. You, you get the, the last question, so it has to be awesome. Go. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 question of all day. <laughs> Why do we only have two minutes left? It's the end of the day. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> Picture. <laughs> so you ask about the time of, of post, or are you talking about? And you know, the frequency, like what is too much? Kind of, you know, how many times should I be blogging? Should I be blogging once a week? Should I be doing it twice? So you're asking for best practices. So, yeah. so, so the first thing I will say, just to sort of throw it out and then let you guys get in your last couple of cents worth here, um, is recognize your blog is an island in a big ocean. So there's nothing you can do that's more effective than write guest posts on other blogs that are in your market segment. Talk to the magazines that publish in your space, talk to the bloggers that work with you, talk to your customers, whatever it takes, get other sites to start pointing to you because then you get on the map. You can have the best blog in the world with the most insightful, extraordinary content and great photos and cats, 
um, hanging from strings and all this, and no one knows. So you got to recognize there's already an existing space that you need to become part of. So now, with a 30 seconds per person, best practice. Come on, go, do it. Uh, I'm going to pull it. I, I've used this line a lot, and it, it, it applies to both your posts and your frequency. Good writing is like a skirt. It should be long enough to cover the subject and short enough to be interesting. I, it's not my line. It's from an old college professor. What I mean by that is don't, there's no best, sometimes a blog post is 200 words, sometimes it's 2,000. Sometimes once a week is plenty. Sometimes five times a day is not enough. Do what you need to do, but keep it interesting. Janine, go. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll reiterate with him on, on keeping it interesting. And, you know, just kind of have fun with it. Um, even if it is kind of a serious business blog, you can still find kind of an interesting way to, you know, twist a phrase or explain something or use an example or something like that so that it stays interesting for people to come and read. You know, um, one of my best blog posts was ever, it, w it was on something legislative, believe it or not, and it was like, hey, buddy, can you spare 500 million? You know, and for some reason, just there was something about that title, Google picked it up, and I started getting all these replies to it. And it was like about insurance or something. I mean, it was really, really boring, but just putting like a little fun twist in there did well. So if you've got some sort of a hook creatively that makes people want to at least come and find out what it is you're talking about, you know, I, I found that successful. And personally for me, I like to blog at least three times a week if it's some sort of a business blog where I'm obligated to blog. Great job. Um, since it's the business track, you know, obviously you want to try and stay focused to, to the, uh, the topic of the business. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a formula um, for time, frequency, anything like that. I would say you want people to keep you at the, the forefront of their minds, so you do want to be posting at least frequent enough that, you know, somebody doesn't forget about you. So if that's twice a week or, or you know, once a month, yeah, I think once a month is probably not enough. Um, Otherwise, in terms of best practices, good writing is key. I mean, we've all talked about it. You're going to hear it the entire time you're here. Um, and, and also formatting. I, you know, I think one of the things, really quick, um, I, I see a lot of bloggers, new bloggers particularly, who will write, you know, they might write 1,000 words, 1,500 words that are fantastic, but it's a big block of text. And when you see a big, big block of text, you get turned off really quickly. That's why we turn pages in books, um, because you, you, you can't really process all that. So. You know, headers, subheaders, break it up a little bit. Pictures are great. All that stuff's fantastic. All right, 30 seconds. Brett, go. <laughs> I can't say much more than they did aside from if that's your question, type it into Google, and you'll get all kinds of great practices because there's tons out there. And um, copy blogger are, yeah, copy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah copy blogger is an awesome resource. Um, so I would go and seek it out because there's no limit to how many best practices articles are out there with great information and videos on YouTube. Great, and I'm going to end, you get one word, yes or no, I'm going to end this with some little tiny bit of controversy, is Twitter dying because it's too big, yes or no? Yes. No. Peanuts. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay.